Hi folks, my name is John Woods and I'm here today to tell you about Real Talk, what it is, where it came from, and hopefully how it can be of use to you or maybe somebody who you support. So my background is that I have worked for Burnaby Association for Community Inclusion in various roles since 1997. And in 2014, I became a certified sexual health educator through Options for Sexual Health. And I now work for that organization as well as part of their clinical services department. Hi, my name is Rihanna and I am a co-founder and editor at See Together Media. And I'm one of the filmmakers that works on Real Talk. My name is Brandon and I'm a filmmaker with See Together Media and I've been filming the Real Talk projects. My name is Kelsey and um, with Real Talk, I'm currently the sexual health outreach facilitator. And today you'll also hear from Colin Darge and Larissa Gunkel who have been really involved in the Real Talk project. What is Real Talk? Real Talk is a sexual health initiative aimed at people living with cognitive disabilities and the people who support them, their friends, their family and their paid staff. Where did Real Talk come from? Most tech companies expect their employees to spend around one day a week or one-fifth of their time on innovation, coming up with new ideas, prototyping, researching, and developing these ideas. So in 2015, Burnaby Association, Possibilities, and Kinsight got together with a social research and development team called In With Forward to come up with a mentorship program for our employees, where certain employees could get together one day a week, one-fifth of their time, for several months, to come up with uh, some new innovative ways that we could maybe do a better job for the folks that we support in areas where we felt our organizations were coming up short. Four of us in this mentorship program felt that our organizations weren't doing such a great job of supporting the sexual health and the sexualities of individuals. It's a sobering statistic that people living with cognitive disabilities are over seven times more likely to experience sexual abuse than the general public. On the flip side, lots and lots of folks that we support tell us that they'd love to have a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a husband, a wife, a partner. And this is a really, really common desire that folks have, but it's not very common for folks to actually find that partner, find that husband, find that wife, find that relationship. So the four of us came together to form a team to look at this problem and to see if there were ways that we could do things a little bit differently, maybe a little bit better. So we know that as a sector, we do a pretty good job of managing various risks that people may face, but we don't always do such a great job of helping folks to build relationships or to fully embrace their rights. And as we entered the research phase of our mentorship, we saw how these strengths and weaknesses of our organizations were borne out in the ways that they supported or didn't support people's sexualities and their sexual health. We spent a lot of time hanging out with individuals receiving support, with their families and friends, and with staff, and we got to spend some time in their day-to-day -day context to find out what was working for them and what really wasn't working for them. Some of the big takeaways from this research portion were that uh, a lot of people reported that they didn't have anyone in their life who they could talk to about dating, love, relationships, sex, or sexuality. Many family members, friends, and people in a professional supporting role reported that they didn't know if it was wise or relevant to talk about dating, love, relationships, sex, and sexuality with the people that they support. Um, I remember one person particularly said, oh, you don't want to wake a sleeping tiger. Many employees also reported that they were not really sure what their organization's policies and procedures were around providing support uh, for dating, love, relationships, sex, sexuality. People said, for example, like, I don't know, am I going to be fired if I tell somebody where they can find birth control pills? Am I going to get in lots of trouble with a family or with my manager if somebody asks me, what does lesbian mean? And I give them an honest and accurate answer. Also, many people reported that when the subject of sexuality came up, it came up in the context of a problem. Um, maybe somebody had been behaving in public in a way that was causing problems for themselves or other people, or maybe somebody was healing from abuse, and at that point people went, okay, we can't get around it, we actually do have to introduce talking about sex and sexuality and things like that. But it was a key thing that sex came up when a problem came up, but not before. We also found that when support around sexuality did happen, it tended to come in the form of maybe a specialist got involved, somebody went to speak to, say, a therapist or a psychologist, or perhaps somebody was sent to a really curriculum-based adult education program specifically around sex ed. You know, somebody might go for six weeks every Wednesday night to go and get this class that was taught on these matters, like things like body science, contraception, reproduction, but it was a very formal kind of experience. So after this research phase, we came up with some what-if questions. 
uh, just to sort of frame where we would love to see things going in terms of the Real Talk initiative. And I think the first what if that we came up with was what if people who are experiencing their sexuality, instead of getting silence or redirection from the folks around them, got affirmation. And this sort of speaks to that idea of not wanting to wake the sleeping tiger. The idea that if we don't talk about this stuff, perhaps people just won't have a sexuality. And it doesn't work because everybody has a sexuality. Every human being has a sexuality. Somebody who will never have sex in their life, somebody who's choosing to be celibate um, their entire life, that person still has a sexuality. It, really simply, sex is about what people do and sexuality is about what people are. It has to do with how their bodies respond to certain things, what they feel attracted to, what they don't feel attracted to. It also has to do with things like how other people perceive them. Do other people perceive them as a sexual threat, as a sexual object? Do other people perceive them as the sort of person who's never going to have sex? All these things tie into a person's sexuality and we all have a sexuality. We're all experiencing it. So the question is not whether the people that we're supporting have a sexuality. The question is only whether or not we're going to give them any affirmation, information, or context about that experience, or if we're just going to be silent about it and leave them to navigate it on their own. The next what if that we came up with was, what if people learned about sex and sexuality and dating and love and relationships through casual conversations with their peers, with their families, with their professional support staff, instead of in formal settings like classrooms? Some folks do really well in terms of like a formal education process in a classroom, but some of the folks that we support haven't had the best experience in classrooms, and it's not necessarily the best format in which to learn about these things. And frankly, it's not really the format that most of us have experienced when we've learned about sexuality and dating and relationships. Most of us have had conversations with our friends, maybe some of us have read advice columns like Dan Savage and the Georgia Strait or Cosmo magazine or something like that. I mean, we don't always get the best advice from those places, but we do look to them as places where we can get information about dating and sex and sexuality. Also, there's plenty of other sexual health resources available out there. Um, there's things like telephone hotlines where you can make an anonymous call and ask questions about sexuality and a sex educator will give you the answer. Or uh, services where you can email your questions and people will give you answers. Or perhaps even just looking online on trusted websites about you know, services like getting tested uh, for STIs or getting tested for pregnancy or getting contraception. These resources are amazing and they're available for us in British Columbia and some folks might just need a little bit of different kinds of support in order to access them. But I think maybe the most important what-if question that we came up with was what if instead of framing sexuality as a problem to be solved, we framed it as something to celebrate. Sexuality is this big, messy part of all of our lives, and for, for most of us, it's you know brought lots of good feelings, lots of bad feelings. There's probably been moments of pleasure, moments of trauma, and what if we could just sort of lean into that rather than saying, oh, this is something that we need to control, we need to shut down, we need to manage it, we need to mitigate it. So at the end of that research phase, we felt really certain that we wanted to make something that was going to be an affirmation, a conversation, and a celebration. So what does Real Talk do? Well, we do a number of things. We shoot videos where people of all ages, all genders, all orientations, all abilities, all backgrounds get together and have unscripted conversations on topics to do with dating, love, relationships, sex, sexuality, things like, how do you know if you want to be alone with someone for the first time? It's a big step if you're meeting for the first time. You want to uh, meet in a public place, like a Tim Hortons or something mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. So then there's more people around yeah. and it's more casual and you yep. know, you can say, oh, my mom's phoning me and I got to go if you need to go or something. Right. How do you know if someone is interested in you romantically? If I have noticed it's been, you know, someone gives you like a lot of eye contact, attention, a lot of smiling. Like I feel there's a lot of like that lean in body language. They look at you or smile at you, want to spend time with you. They might wink at you or something. What is an STI? How do you prevent them? An STI is a sexually transmitted infection. You can do as much as you can to prevent it. Uh, but if for some reason it were to happen, you just have to be honest, especially with your partner or partners. Mm -hmm. I would feel ashamed if I had it. 
I would feel embarrassed. I would feel like, oh my God, you know, what have I done? I would say that I want to not feel embarrassed by it, but I know there's a little part of me that also succumbs to societal pressures to feel shameful about it. Um, have you ever been tested for STIs, John? I actually got tested just recently. I often go to the Options for Sexual Health Clinic and what I wind up doing there is giving a urine sample and then they write me up a requisition form and I go to a lab and give a blood sample. What does consent mean? Consent means that you're saying, okay, let's do this. If something is gonna happen, everybody has to agree to it. This is good, this yeah. is fine. This is okay. Reminding I'm them that too. Get yeah. with this. We put all these videos up on our website, which is www.real-talk.org, and people can go there and watch them. Um, they're free, they're hosted on YouTube, and they're on our website. And lots of folks make use of these videos at home with their families and friends. They'll watch them. Sometimes these videos can be like a good, you know, conversation starter for uh, an awkward topic. You know, watch the video first and then ask the person, hmm, what did you think about this? Did you agree with what they were saying? Did you disagree? And it can just be a way of getting the ball rolling for topics that can be, you know, sometimes a little bit harder or awkward to talk about. I think that video is an incredibly powerful medium to basically teach people about relationships and sexuality and to show them that they're not alone and that there, there are other people who uh, face the same challenges or similar challenges as them. I, you know, I understand that Real Talk is here to serve people with diverse abilities, but I can even see it having you know, um, foundations for people in high school or just any young people with any kind of ability. Growing up, I didn't have a family that was very open when it came to sexuality. And a lot of this stuff, I, I guess, I don't know, I didn't learn until much later in life, but it would have been great to have this information. So I just, yeah, I really wish that I had real talk when I was a kid or a teenager. Uh, the best part of being in Real Talk videos is to actually share my experiences in case people have had similar or the same experiences and actually to educate and share with people what can actually happen from my experiences when it comes to relationships. The most important thing that I uh, talked about was mostly online dating. That just like whether you have limitations or disabilities, it's still like with an able-bodied person. You still need to be cautious. You still need to have a sixth sense and actually take your time, understand it, make sure that you're doing the best choices for you in your life. Yeah, so I'm a big advocate for LGBT, so um, in Real Talk, I like to talk about those topics and um, love, um, our gender, even though many people still, it's like, oh, you shouldn't talk about it. It's like, not many people care and stuff like that, but I think it's important to talk about, and I have a right to talk about it. Soon into the first uh, season filming, um, I realized that there was something really interesting about the format that we were taking and how intimate these conversations were. They really have conversations with each other that um, people that know each other for years may not ever have. We also host uh, a calendar of free events throughout the year where folks can get together um, and watch some of these videos over a casual meal. Usually we have some pizza and it's just in a very casual environment with some couches and some coffee tables, a big screen TV and a certified sexual health educator is also present there to help facilitate some conversation. So people can watch some of these conversation videos and they can then have the opportunity, if they want to, to practice having this kind of conversation in an environment that's non-judgmental, in an environment that's really kind of supportive. As a staff team, uh, we're really conscious of how the physical space we are in for an event feels. Things like lighting, things that make things feel institutional, like a classroom or a boardroom, or um, if it's a space that folks um, 
uh, spend time in on a regular basis, how do they interact with that space specifically? Is it a space they're used to um, sitting around and waiting um, before something else happens? Uh, do they spend a lot of time being kind of unenthused, unengaged, bored in that space? And how do we have different kinds of furniture arrangements and can we bring in plants and can we can we make it feel more cozy and inviting and welcoming. Um, how facilitators present is another thing so we try not to physically be at the front of the room if we can help it. Hopefully on the ground um, uh, so that they're among the folks who are there so it's not like a they're standing above them kind of talking physically down to them. We have these really great conversations about sexuality and love and dating and relationships or kind of anything under that umbrella. I'm a sexual health educator, so I'm a sex ed resource in the room. Another way in which a Real Talk pizza party is sort of different from a typical sex ed class is that there's no specific curriculum that we're really trying to get across. Of course, we do always talk about things like safer sex and consent and STIs and healthy relationships versus unhealthy relationships in our Real Talk events. But apart from that, we don't have any specific technical curriculum that we're really trying to get across. We find that people are much more engaged and much more wanting to show up to these events when we're talking about what they want to talk about, when they get to drive the conversation. Really, the conversations are driven by what's coming up organically in the room. What questions do individuals have? What's most interesting to them? What are they most curious about? What do they want to know about? Um, we try and make sure that their, their voices are the voices that are heard most in the room. Um, I really try and drive that I'm a sex educator, but I'm not a teacher. I'm not there to um, be in any kind of classroom setting. So folks at the very beginning, they tell us why they're there. If they want to discuss uh, safer sex or masturbation or pleasure or where to find folks that they can date. And whatever they say is what drives the next two hours. Uh, they're the experts of their lived experiences about um, their hopes and desires around dating and sex and love if they have them. And so they're the ones who decide what we talk about what questions get asked, um, things that they're comfortable exploring, if so, and sometimes that leads to peer conversations. If one person decides, you know what's really great, I want to talk about um, uh, masturbation or pleasure or different kind of toys that work for different kinds of bodies, um, it's really easy for one per participant to bring that up and say, I'm curious about this. And um, it's not like it's then led back to me as an I drive that conversation, it's opened to the room. And so everyone who's sitting there has a chance to absorb what they think about that if they have their own questions or maybe a participant, and I've seen this quite a few times, uh, participants go, oh, I have this really great story about that and I wanna share this experience. Um, so it's not me deciding what we talk about, it's them deciding what's, what brought them to the event. And we all watch the videos together and we talk about it some more and then we eat some pizza. That's great. Another thing that our facilitators like to get across at these pizza party events is also just getting folks to start thinking about who in their life they could have these kinds of conversations with outside of a Real Talk event. Is there a family member or a trusted friend or a trusted staff who they can have this kind of dialogue with? Where do you get advice on relationships and sex? Who do I go to for advice? Uh, probably my sister. She's 21 years older than me, which really helps. So it's like having a cool mom. I often go to my family. Mostly, yeah, mostly my mom. Um, occasionally a, a really trusted friend. Is there a particular sexual health service in the Lower Mainland that might work for them? You know, do they like talking on the phone? Are they shy to talk on the phone, but they like texting? Do they prefer graphic novels? Because there's all sorts of sexual health education resources out there that are available in different modalities, different styles of communication. So our facilitators really start to get people thinking about where they can go next after the event is over. In addition to pizza party workshops, we also run workshops that are aimed at supporters of people living with cognitive disabilities. That is, friends, family, and professional staff and these are called approachable support workshops. The main point of these is to help folks start to feel a little bit more comfortable being the other half of that conversation. Being that person who can hear these questions about dating, love, relationships, sex, hold space for them, 
reflect on them, and then help the person get the information that they need. It's absolutely natural for us to feel uncomfortable talking about sex or sexuality or dating or relationships. We're not really encouraged to talk about this sort of thing in our society. And we've all grown up in the context that we've grown up in. You know, some of us may have had some really bad experiences around this stuff when we were younger. Some of us may have grown up in families where it was just not considered appropriate to talk about this stuff. So these workshops focus on ways of starting to feel more comfortable with feeling uncomfortable. And they also talk about different resources that are available that people could make use of and start to think about where they could refer this person to or where they could start exploring. What's the answer to that question? So why do we do these things? Why would somebody want to go to a Real Talk event? Why would we open up this can of worms in the first place? Well, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, we know that people who have learned to talk about dating and love and relationships and sex, they're safer, frankly. Um, folks who are predators, who are looking for potential victims for sexual abuse, are looking for people who have a great deal of shame and not really a lot of language or much of a network to talk about these things. They rely on people's shame and their silence in order to continue the abuse. So people who have someone in their life who they can talk to about this stuff, who know the right language to use, and who feel comfortable talking about these sorts of things and don't feel a lot of shame about it, these folks are going to be much safer. They're going to be much less likely to be targeted by potential abusers. As well, people who have learned to talk about dating, love, and relationships and sex are less likely to uh, behave in ways that might cause them problems. If there's an open dialogue with someone in their life about like, that's okay to do in public, but that needs to be happening in private, then it doesn't have to be a conversation that's coming up after the fact when something has gone wrong. And as well, people who have learned to talk about relationships, sexuality, sex, dating, etc. are less likely to experience anxiety and depression. For one thing, rejection happens to everybody. And I think it's fair to say that it may happen to people living with cognitive disabilities more than most. So if somebody does experience rejection or heartbreak in, in the world of dating and relationships and sex, if they have someone in their life they can talk to about this to maybe hear like, oh, you know, it's not just you. Um, other people experience rejection. Or if they're able to watch a Real Talk video in which people talk about like, yeah, I got rejected too. This is what I did to take care of myself. It can help build a little bit more resilience knowing that they're not alone. Uh, as well, because sexuality is such uh, a part of human life, it can be a big thing that people are holding on to inside of them that they're having big feelings about, but they're not really able to express those feelings, and that can build up a lot of um, intense emotion. I think this is particularly true for folks who are in the LGBTQ community. If somebody does have a queer sexual identity and they feel like it might not be safe to talk about it to people, that can be a big thing. And we do know that folks who are in the LGBTQ community who are also facing other challenges like having a cognitive disability, they are at most risk for suffering from depression, for being under housed and even for things like suicide. So it's just a safer thing if folks have somebody in their life who they can talk openly to about this sort of thing. As well, people who've learned to talk about dating, love, relationships, sex, and sexuality, they make better choices. Uh, statistics show that in uh, places where there is uh, sexual health education in schools, teenagers in those schools tend to wait longer before first trying sex for themselves. As well, people who talk openly about dating, love, relationships, sex, and sexuality make better choices around contraception. They're much more likely to be using condoms, hormonal contraception, whatever form works best. They're more likely to say, call up a hotline and have a conversation with somebody there about what form might work best for them. If it's not a taboo subject, people can get the information that they need to protect themselves against pregnancy if they don't want to be pregnant or against STIs. And lastly, and, and frankly this is the part that's most important to me, is that people who have learned to talk about dating, love, relationships, and sex have more tools to pursue these goals in their life if they want them. If they want to find a partner, they have more tools to go out and find one. They'll have learned a little bit more about where did other people meet their partners, in what context, how do people show that they're attracted, how do people show that they're not attracted. And they'll also hear that everybody goes through rejection. Everyone experiences loneliness when they are looking for this sort of thing in their life. And this will give them the resilience to carry on when it looks like maybe it won't ever happen for them. It helps keep hope alive. 
Real Talk has been offering events for just over a year now and it's been a lot of learning in that time. One thing that we really try to do with Real Talk is to quickly and nimbly respond to feedback that we're getting from the participants. We want to make it more relevant for them, more entertaining, more interesting for them throughout. And there's a number of ways in which we do this. Uh, our facilitators, for example, are always taking note of what conversations are coming up in the events. And do we have video content that actually speaks to those conversation topics? If not, then we make sure that the next time we shoot a round of videos, we include that particular subject area in our next round of conversation videos. Uh, we have a sort of formal process for this where people can make talkback videos. Uh, after an event, if somebody's interested and feels positively moved, they can just get in front of a camera and talk about their experience at the event, what they liked, what they didn't like, what they thought we should be doing differently, or what they think we should be offering videos on. About response, because when you get when you get when you have a boyfriend girlfriend, you, that's fine. If you work, so once you get engaged, if you're ready to make the next marriage, and once you get married, then you decide to the next thing is married. You got to be able to see that you love each other. You got to have the income. What would you like to hear more about next time? Something about like condoms or something, and like uh, how did sex get started and things like that. Relationships are good, but it is a bumpy road ahead when, so just prepare on what you're going to get when you're in a relationship with somebody. So you can expect there's going to be good times and bad times? Yes. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hi, I'm just wondering why there aren't any videos on online dating and safety around that because I have a client who's really interested in finding a partner through online dating, but I want to make sure that he does it in a safe way. What's your experience been like with meeting people online? I tried Tinder for like a summer. Definitely the advantage of Tinder is that it doesn't take long to create a profile. Well, okay. <laughs> it's a very simple process. Mm -hmm. You get a lot of people that aren't who they say they are, mm -hmm. so video chatting them is a really good idea. Mm -hmm. Video chatting is a really good way of um, having the first step of meeting online, or meeting offline and in real life. This kind of feedback has led us to a number of course corrections over the past while. Uh, early on, we had uh, an original artist on our team who was really fantastic and put together some just beautiful, touching, sweet, uh, original artworks that formed uh, a big part of our web look, they formed a big part of the literature that we were giving out at events, and we thought these were great and they were kind of hipster, and they, they just had this really nice feel to them. But we quickly got feedback from the folks that we were supporting that these actually looked a lot like children's book illustrations. And people were very firm that they didn't want anything at these events that looked like they might be aimed at kids rather than adults, particularly when we're talking about this subject area. So that was a point that we took uh, to heart very early on. We switched up the graphic design style, we switched up our graphic design uh, illustrator, and we now have a feel that we think is like graphically, it's, it's fun, it's contemporary, it's definitely got that kind of illustrated cartoon-like feel, but it also has much more of a grown-up feel for it. It looks like something that you might see as an illustration, say, in the New Yorker magazine, rather than in a children's book. Another thing we did early on was we put a big list of resources in the swag bags that we give away uh, at the end of each event. And we thought this was a nice, big, comprehensive list, and we passed them out, and we saw that people were just chucking them out. They were uninteresting, they looked really institutional, they looked kind of boring, they looked like the sort of thing that might, like best case scenario, is they might get tacked to a cork board somewhere in an office and forgotten about. So we started thinking about what could we do differently to get the information about these resources across better to folks. And we thought, if instead of leading with the resources, what if we led with stories about individuals and the resources that they made use of and why? It's led us to create a number of comic books. Uh, these comic books feature folks living with different cognitive disabilities and they talk about where they get their sexual health information, where they try to meet people if they want to date, uh, what their relationship is with pleasure, what kinds of resources do they use? Do they prefer to use hotlines? Do they prefer to go on the internet and find their information? 
And so these have had much more of an impact. People are really interested to, to read them. They're kind of curious. The content is sometimes very frank sexual content in a lot of cases. So that certainly piques people's interest and it does have them read through to the very end. And we found that people are much more likely now to engage with these resources listed in the comic books if they actually have a story about somebody using those resources. It's not a hypothetical name that's on a resource list. It's an actual story about somebody using that resource and why. And these uh, comic books exist as hard copy things that we give out at our events and we're in the process of turning a bunch of them right now into videos as well. Another course correction was where we discovered that we really weren't say walking the walk in terms of embodying our values in our facilitation style at our events. Um, I want to say at the very beginning when we were doing a bit of like a greeting and setting some like um, uh, some welcome agreements for the group, um, it was just the facilitator talking for like a long period of time and as much as a group we tried to uphold this idea that um, it's very much about the folks who attend and not us. That wasn't actually being practiced because the first voice that was held in the room for like 15 minutes was just the facilitator. So we scrapped that and um, uh, we tried to follow what, I think it was like an unfacilitation model that we began, where right away, as soon as possible, our voices are not the only voice heard in the room. So we introduce ourselves, yes, we make sure that the folk know who we are in our roles, but then we immediately shift into asking them why they're there and what topics brought them to that conversation. Uh, there's definitely been a shift in um, the energy folks have uh, right away. So um, initially, when, before we were following that model, folks would come in and they'd sit down and you could tell that they were kind of um, a mix of emotions from like, curious, joyful, excited, uh, maybe apprehensive, um, but right away they um, were responding to a classroom model of being talked at for 15 minutes and that just would bring the energy down to like, okay, well, I, I'd hoped this was about me, but I guess this is just another classroom. And when we moved to the unfacilitation model, it was, it was much more apparent that their energy was allowed to kind of move with the conversation and, and their voices were right away asked to be part of the room. And that was, that allowed for a lot more of like, okay, I feel this way, let's talk about it, as opposed to just being talked at. Current questions and hopes for the future. Right now we find ourselves in an interesting place where a number of folks who are coming to our events say that the videos are maybe a little bit too advanced, they go by too quickly, people are talking too fast, I know I'm certainly guilty of that. Do you remember the videos that we watched at the pizza party? Uh, uh. It, they went a bit too fast for me to keep up with the conversation. Right, okay. On the other hand, we have folks saying, these videos are pretty basic. They're just covering stuff that I think I already know, and I'm really interested in finding out more. Could you make videos that are maybe like a part two or a part three that give you more in-depth information on subjects or dive into some subjects that maybe aren't the most common ones that people want to discuss at events? Well, it'd be good to have more information mm. or places you can actually get sex toys or, or costumes or anything like that. I would probably talk about um, transgender, sex toys, masturbation, or, or if there's different dynamics. If one person's transgender and they come across someone that's straight or suddenly someone realizes they're bisexual, how does that relationship work? Or if someone is a drag queen or a cross-dresser and they come up with someone that's a little bit with a phobia, but they want to explore a relationship, how would that look? So go in more detail and more in depth. We got feedback over the last year that it was valuable to do some of these events in a space that were just for female identified people. So we created an event, a women's event called Tough Cookies, and we've done it a couple of times now and it's been quite successful. And the vibe is very different in those places. Um, I don't know this firsthand because I don't go into those places, but our facilitators tell us that the folks there just feel a little bit more relaxed and less on edge than they are when they're in a co-ed situation. They found that they were more easily able to communicate freely and say what was on their mind when they weren't feeling like they were being judged in a, in a mixed gender space. 
So there's certainly folks for whom that model works really well, so we're going to continue to do that. And I know that there have been some folks calling for a specifically LGBTQ-focused Real Talk event. I would love to see a pizza party with the LGBT people, like gays and lesbians. <laughs> it doesn't quite matter. As long as they're comfortable with me, I'm comfortable with them, and yeah, I would love that. Really do. Uh, so we've got one planned for July of this year to try it out to see how it goes. Down the road, we'd like to scale Real Talk beyond the Lower Mainland so that we can offer it in Victoria or all over British Columbia or potentially all over Canada. And when we close in on the last year of our funding a couple of years from now, part of that last year is going to be coming up with a plan for scale to see if either that funder or maybe another funder finds it worthwhile to take Real Talk beyond the Lower Mainland. So here's some ways that you can use Real Talk. Uh, anywhere in BC, or in fact anywhere in the world, you can access our Real Talk videos from our website or from our YouTube channel, and you can use them as a way of, you know, sort of icebreaking conversations about these things, or if somebody just really, really doesn't want to have a conversation with you about this stuff, but you feel it might be worthwhile for them to know some information, you can just give them these links to these videos and say, hey, check these out. If you don't want to talk to me about it, that's cool. I respect your boundaries, but watching these videos might actually give you some interesting information. If you live in the Greater Vancouver area, you can come to a Real Talk event, either a pizza party or you can come to an approachable support workshop for friends and family and staff. And these events are completely free, it doesn't cost a dime to show up. Real Talk is funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. That means that we are able to offer all of our services, our workshops, our events, our videos, completely free. A person doesn't have to be eligible for CLBC funding to come to a Real Talk event. Anyone who feels like they could benefit from coming to a Real Talk pizza party workshop or a Real Talk approachable support workshop for family, friends, and staff is welcome to come on down. All you have to do is register so we know how many folks are going to be showing up and that's really all there is to it. As well, if you'd like Real Talk to come to your organization and provide some professional development training for your staff, that's the thing that we can do as well. We can co-design a curriculum for you that speaks to the needs that are most important for your staff and the folks that you support and come in and deliver that. And again, that is something that we can provide for you absolutely free. If you have further questions for me, or if, say, for example, you'd like Real Talk to come and do a training session at your organization, or say you're interested in supporting someone to come to one of our uh, pizza party events, please don't hesitate to be in touch with me. You can reach me at john, J-O-H-N, at real-talk.org, and our web address is real-talk.org. Once again, thank you so much for being here and I'm really glad that you've taken an interest in supporting people to have better outcomes in the area of dating, love, relationships and sex in their lives. Thank you.